Welcome to Gateway Sermons, and thank you for joining us as we venture together through God's Word. And as 1 John chapter 4 teaches us, as it said before the song, we feel this way about you only because you loved us first. You sought us, God, long before we sought you, and because we never could seek you. If you didn't go seeking, if you weren't the ultimate missionary, if you didn't love, if you didn't save, if that wasn't who you were, we would never seek you. So Lord, our reasons for praising you are so much more than we can even fathom. So yet you are pleased with the songs of your redeemed people. And God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for another opportunity to gather together as one family in this place, jars of clay, everyone. Lord, would you work this morning? God, would you work? Would your Holy Spirit come and dwell with us and move amongst us in these next moments? God, fill me with your Holy Spirit Cover me in your power and with your voice, Father, speak through me, I pray. Bring these words to life. And Father, help us listen. To sit under your word is as much an act of worship as singing your word back to you is. So Lord, as we continue to worship now, this time through your word as it comes from the pages of scripture in the form of a sermon would you be with us word of God speak bread of life fill us we ask in the name of Jesus Christ amen this week when I was studying for this this sermon um, for some reason I think I understand the reason but for whatever reason I was thinking about all those stories that we see which by the way we see far too many of them in the 21st century of people that uh, get in behind fences at a zoo or in animal enclosures where they shouldn't be and something horrible happens to them. There are way too many stories like that for the 21st century. And as I looked for one, I wanted to look for a specific one. I came across one of uh, a man in Ningbo, China, uh, who went to the zoo, the Young Or Zoo, with his wife and their two children. And there was another couple with them. I'm not sure if they had kids, but they decided to go to the zoo for the day. For whatever reason, they sent the the, the wives and the kids to go through the ticket booth the normal way. And the two dads, or the two husbands anyway, decided that they they weren't going to pay. They were going to try and get in for free to save some money. So they went over to where they found a spot in a fence where they could get up. They got about halfway up, and then they realized that there was a big sign there that said, this is the tiger enclosure area. The one guy was like, you know, that, that's it, I'm not going any further. The other guy, the husband and the father of the two kids, still jumped over the fence. And there were four, three or four tigers in that enclosure that, suffice to say, were not pleased that he did not pay his ticket price for full admission. And I don't have to tell you what happened. Unfortunately, there was a video. And it was awful. And his wife and his two kids watched the whole thing. For over an hour, those tigers did what tigers do because they're tigers, which is why you don't go into tiger enclosures as a person, and he died. He he was killed. He didn't make it. And it just, it just, there are things in this world, there are realities, and one of those realities is you cannot get close to things that will kill you unless you absolutely have to. So, I mean, maybe your job puts you near dangerous equipment or something or dangerous things like that. that. That happens. That's understandable. You're not being reckless. You're trying to feed your family or do your job. But for the most part, you can't get close to things that will kill you. And one of the realities about our great God is that if Christ isn't in between us and him, the simple matter is, is if we get too close, we won't make it. And the whole Old Testament era was defined once Adam sinned and fell in the garden way back in the beginning by distance, by the separation between God and us. The whole Old Testament, the whole Old Covenant religious system had distance and the fact that we can't get close to God woven into it. 
So priests had certain duties and there were certain regulations. And the high priest, he could go into the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle or once the temple was built, but he could only go in once a year. He could only go in on the Day of Atonement. And they had to, to weave bells and pomegranates and things like that onto the bottom of his vestments. And they had to tie a little rope around his ankle because if he did anything wrong that close to God's presence where God said he would dwell with Israel, if he did anything wrong and that God would strike him dead instantly, but you couldn't go in and get him or you would be killed, so they'd have to pull him out if he didn't make it. Can't get too close to things that are dangerous, and nothing is more dangerous to human beings than an infinitely holy God. But then he comes in human flesh. He becomes a human being, God the Son, takes on flesh, and suddenly everything changes. Now the entire relationship, rather than being dictated by distance, is characterized by closeness, and all because of Jesus. And the word that kept coming to mind as we read this story here at the end of Luke chapter 7 about this woman is reckless. Jesus forgave a deeply sinful woman who recklessly expressed her love for him. And that brings us to verse 36 of Luke chapter 7. And I'm just going to read this. We're going to walk through the story and then we'll talk about some of the implications of it. All right, so Luke chapter 7, verse 36. Then one of the Pharisees invited him to eat with him. He entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. So Jesus ate with ungodly people. He ate with ungodly people that knew they were ungodly people. And he ate with ungodly people that thought they were godly people. He ate with everybody because Jesus ate with sinners. And a woman in the town who was a sinner found out that Jesus was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house. Now, why does the text describe her that way? A woman who was a sinner. All people are sinners. Why is there any need to call it out? Probably because, beloved, we can imply from what it says there, what the Pharisee in the house says about her later, that she was a prostitute. She was a sinful woman. And she finds out, word carries, word spreads that Jesus is in this Pharisee's house. He's reclining at the table, which by the way, tables, we're talking here about a table that's about 18 inches off the ground, if that. And when people would recline at a table in this culture, they would lean on their, on their forearm, they would lean on the table and eat and drink, and their legs would be kind of out to the side of them or out behind them. So that's where Jesus is, sitting in the Pharisee's house, eating and drinking with what would have been more Pharisees and very upstanding and respectful people because they're the only people that'd be allowed in a Pharisee's house. He's reclining at the table with them. She, the woman, brought an alabaster jar of perfume, very expensive ointment, and stood behind him at his feet, weeping. Not crying, weeping. And began to wash his feet with her tears. She wiped his feet with her hair, kissing them and anointing them with the perfume. So just get in your mind the, this gathering of extremely decent, upstanding people, and in comes a woman, a sinful woman, stands behind his feet, but at some point she must have dropped down on her knees because she couldn't wash his feet from a standing position. So she got on her knees and she began to pour out this very expensive perfume on his feet after she had wept so hard and so much that his feet were covered enough in the moisture of her tears that she could wash them with her hands. First century Palestinian feet. Disgusting feet. Be like walking around Brawley your whole life with no shoes on. It's the same type of climate, same type of setting. And she's weeping so much she can use those tears to wipe his feet and wash them off, and then she uses her own hair to dry them, and then she's pouring out perfume on them. Verse 39, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, this man, if he were a prophet, so we're back, this is how this story fits into the flow of Luke chapter 7. What has been the problem all along? What have they been, been in verses 19 and 20, what did John the Baptist send two disciples to ask Jesus? Are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? 
So, so the identity of Jesus and who Jesus really is, is he the prophet sent from heaven? Is he the one that is worthy of all worship and all loyalty? Right? That's been the question the whole time. And Simon, the Pharisee in this house, does not believe he is the one. Notice what he says. This man, and he says this inside. He doesn't say this out loud. Right? Self-righteous people usually don't have the guts to betray themselves out loud. So he says it in his head. This man, if he were a prophet who would know who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him. She's a sinner. And if he was a prophet, if he really had insight into her real character, he would know she had no business touching him. He's not from God. If he was a prophet, he would know who she is. He would know what she is. Do you see the way he's talking about her? How he completely dehumanizes her? And if he were a prophet, he would have the insight into who she is to know he shouldn't be touching her or she shouldn't be touching him. Jesus replied to him in verse 40, Simon, I have something to say to you. Prophet. He does have insight into your character and into exactly what we're thinking all the time, including this moment with Simon. He is a prophet, the prophet. I have something to say to you. He said, say it, teacher. Jesus replied to him, I'm sorry, he said, say it, teacher, verse 41. A creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. So a denarii is a Roman form of currency. It's worth about a day's wages. So you're looking at two debtors that one has about a year and a half, year and a half's worth of wages that he needs to pay back, and the other one has about a month and a half, uh, half's worth of wages that he needs to, to pay back to this creditor since they could not pay it back. Since they could not, neither one, pay it back. He graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Why is that where Jesus goes? Why is that his response to Simon's response to this woman? Which of them will love him more? And again, Jesus is asking questions that have very obvious answers. Simon answered, I suppose the one he forgave more. You just hear the smugness, but he gets it. Of course, if you were forgiven of a larger debt, you would be more grateful to the person who forgave it. Turning to the woman, he said to Simon. So where Simon and self-righteous religion dehumanize, Jesus brings people into focus and values them regardless of who they are. Jesus, turning to the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? You see what Jesus is doing? Look at her. Look at her. I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she with her tears has washed my feet and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she hasn't stopped kissing my feet since I came in. You didn't anoint my head with olive oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfume. There's been a major breach of cultural custom here that that is lying underneath the text. This is an honor and shame culture. It's an ancient culture, but it's an honor and shame culture. When you hosted a guest, you anointed them, you kissed them. That's what you did. You showed whoever came into your house honor because they were coming to you. You were hosting them. And so that was the cultural norm. Simon is saying a ton of what he thinks about Jesus by not doing any of those things, by not even be willing to do what is culturally normal for Jesus. That's how little he thinks of him. And so the proper response to Jesus doesn't come from the self-righteous, law-knowing, Bible-believing, religious man. It comes from the prostitute. Therefore, I tell you. So why is therefore there? Because of what she had done. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. That's why she loved much. But the one who is forgiven little loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this man who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. 
go in peace. Your faith has saved you because that's what all this was. We thought he might say your love has saved you, but no, 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 love comes from her. Faith comes from God. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now I'm going to read to verse 3 of chapter 8 because that this little paragraph should be the end of this story. Um, scribes, remember when they were translating scripture and writing it down, they added the chapter breaks and the verse numbers and all that. This is normally one flow, and sometimes that's really helpful. And then times like this, it breaks up a story. It, it, it takes away from something, not on purpose, because you miss the point of it. Look at what follows here. Afterward, he was traveling from one town and village to another, preaching and telling the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12 were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Mary called Magdalene. Seven demons had come out of her. Seven demons tormented Mary Magdalene day and night, and Christ had delivered her. These are women that are, had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. These are women that what? Have been delivered from much and forgiven of much. That's why Luke gives a quantity. Only Luke has verses 1 through 3 of chapter 8 in his gospel. The other gospel writers, it didn't fit into the story they were telling, but for Luke, this is important. This is important that there were women, the marginalized, more like the least of society in this culture. They were following him. Mary called Magdalene, seven demons had come out of her. Joanna, the wife of Chuzza, Herod's steward. Susanna, we don't know anything about Susanna. And many others who were supporting them from their possessions. The public ministry of Jesus Christ was supported in part, not by the breadwinners and the high folks of culture, but by women who at that time didn't have money to support ministries and weren't recognized and weren't valued. But then Jesus came to town. It's an amazing thing, by the way, just quickly, that love and money are linked here so closely. You give in proportion to how much you value something. You give in proportion to how much you value something. And so what if the question we should be asking in our giving is not how much should I give based on what I make, what would it look like if we begin to say, I should give in proportion to my affection for Jesus, like these women did? So here's the thing, beloved. There's one main thing to say this morning. I'm going to try to support it and build it up a little bit, but I think the main thing we're seeing in this story is that truly loving Jesus, truly loving Jesus, because that's what is at issue here depends on genuinely recognizing your own sinfulness. Truly loving Jesus depends on genuinely recognizing your own sinfulness. And I think this is the core of Christianity. What we're talking about this morning is what everything is about. Literally, the end of verse 47 proves it's right there in front of us that all failure to love Jesus well and be fully devoted to him is a gospel problem. It is a lack of understanding how much we've been forgiven for. That disbelief, that lack of realization lies at the heart of everything that's wrong with us in our relationship with Jesus Christ and therefore in our relationship to and with everything and everyone else. Why was she so reckless? The text tells us. Why was she not, why was the utter embarrassment and shame and dehumanization that she would face by rushing into that room or walking into that room or whatever it was, why was that not enough to keep her from getting to Jesus so that she could show her affection for him by anointing his feet and washing his feet? Why wasn't that concern enough to keep her out? Because... 
It's the difference between much and little. It's the difference between what you realize. This kind of love is, is kind of like the love that causes us to blow our budgets at Christmas time on people that we love. And I know that's not a good thing. It's not a good thing to be irresponsible with your budget. But you, you, you know what I'm saying. That, that, that just, I just want to... I remember when, when my first daughter, Isabella, was born. And I remember when we got her home, the day we brought her home from the hospital, I went to Target and bought an absolute mess load of stuffed animals. And most of them were Muppet babies. And I piled... I piled Muppet babies and stuffed animals and toys on this three-day-old child that can't even register, if I'm not mistaken, can't even register pastels yet in her vision. She can only see primary. She has no, she, no frame of reference, no vocabulary, doesn't know anything. But why did I do that? Why do we do things like that? Because you just want to say, I, I love you so much. I just want you to know and for us, one of the only ways we know how to express it is to pour out our possessions, is to pour out something we have or something that we can buy because that's what we connect with love. So just, just have this. I want to pour it out on you. I want you to feel the depth of what I'm feeling for you. You know, you, 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 that's how she loved Jesus. She wasn't afraid of getting close. And remember, like we were talking about earlier, do you know what would have happened to her or anyone like this in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant era before Jesus arrives, if you would have had a well-meaning heart and you were a very devoted Old Covenant religious person and just could not get over the gratitude and the love that you felt for Yahweh, your covenant God, and if you said, I'm just, look, I got to take everything. I got to take this jar of perfume, this, and I'm going to run into the Holy of Holies where the presence of God is, and I'm going to pour it out on him because I love him so much, and I want to worship him. I'm going to show him how much I value him. You would have been obliterated. Didn't matter how well-meaning your heart would have been. It wouldn't have mattered how religiously devoted you were. There was a law, and you could not come, and the law stood in between you and devotion. And now you can get this close. You can wash the feet of God with perfume made from oils and plants and things like that. Jesus accepts it from her and he pardons her. He pardons her. She was guilty. But this is what Jesus does. Do you remember the woman caught in adultery near the end of John chapter 7 and the beginning of chapter 8, and all those good religious men that brought, dragged her to Jesus and said, hey, the law says we stone her for being an adulteress. What do you say, teacher? And he doodles in the sand for a minute, and then he says that line that cuts across the ages, let the one who is without sin be the first to cast the stone. And one by one, they all put down their stones and walk away because even the Pharisees know deep down inside, it's not like they're totally without sin. The beautiful thing about that story in that moment is not what those men did. It's the fact that there was one standing in their midst that had no sin and could have pelted her to death with rocks and been totally justified, and his name was Jesus. And instead, he defended her and saved her life. This is who he is. This is at the very essence of who God is. All the old covenant stuff, all that stuff was type and shadow, pointing to something. This is substance. You're getting a clearer picture of the God of the Bible in this text than all the Old Testament put together. He is honored by reckless love. He is honored by sloppy, intrusive, reckless, genuine love. The kind of love that shows faith in him rather than a sense of self-preservation. So the bottom line is, if you aren't a wretch, Jesus has nothing for you. If you aren't a wretch, Jesus has nothing for you. We won't love him in the way that honors him 
until we really know how much we don't deserve him. She wasn't there because she thought she deserved an audience with the king. She was there because she knew she had no business being there. And it changed her so much and reached so deep down into her soul that she was willing to risk everything to run in just to be at his feet. If you aren't a wretch, you don't realize you're a wretch, you'll end up like Simon. Why wasn't Simon reckless? Why did he love little? That's, again, that's what's at issue here. She loved much, he loved little. Why? I mean, Simon probably knew that he was guilty of respectable sins. I mean, none of us have a problem saying, well, nobody, you know, nobody's perfect. You know, Simon would say, no, none is perfect but God. Simon could quote scripture for you literally back to front. You no, know, I'm, I'm, I'm guilty, you know, that there's some pride sometimes, and, you know, but who isn't prideful? That, you know, I have a bad temper, uh, I gossip, you know, I complain. But those aren't, I mean, those aren't like big deal sins. And I'm, I'm really, I've, you know, I haven't done the heavy hitters. I'm just not perfect. And if that's all you need forgiven for or think you've been forgiven of, then you won't embarrass yourself loving Jesus. Why would you? He didn't give you that much, right? He just cleaned you up a little bit. So where does a lack of genuine worship really come from? Is it the music's fault? Is it the preacher's fault? Is it everybody's fault but yours? Is it your spouse's fault? Your school's fault? Your job's fault? The government's fault? The liberal's fault? The conservative's fault? Or maybe you just don't really believe Jesus has forgiven you of that much. Because it doesn't matter what you owe. You see that. It doesn't matter what you owe. You can't pay him back. You don't have it in you to get him to accept you. That's where love or the lack of it comes from. The least in the kingdom, remember earlier in chapter 7, the least in the kingdom show great honor to Jesus. Simon is a child of the world. Simon in this, that's what Luke is doing in 36 to 50. He's displaying what he just said about how wisdom will be vindicated by all her children. And the fact that people reject Jesus and don't value Jesus will be shown or demonstrated or vindicated by what they do. You know, you pl we played a flute for you. You didn't dance. We sang sad songs. You didn't lament. The woman is a child of wisdom. She is vindicating the worth of Jesus in this moment. Simon is a child of the world. He is demeaning the worth of Jesus in this moment. He can't even believe he's a prophet. But the worship and honor of Jesus are on the line in how you love him. The worship and honor of Jesus are on the line in how you love him. This is why, if you don't hear anything else today, please stay with me for just a few moments here. This is why we must learn that the opposite of sin is not virtue. The opposite of sin is faith. Now, that I don't read Kierkegaard, but that actually comes originally from Simon Kierkegaard. I was reading about him in another book. This is absolutely right. This is why we have to learn the opposite of sin is not virtue. The opposite of sin is faith. Now, here's why that matters. Because of how it affects your mindset. Stay with me for just a minute. If the opposite of sin is virtue, if all Jesus is there for is to help you live a better life and to help you be more successful, all you have to do is be good enough to meet your own standards. You just have to stop behaving this way and start behaving that way. Once you do that, following Jesus, well, that becomes about the bare minimum necessary 
to not be really bad. And maybe we're just filled with in our churches and surrounded with people that are thinking, huh, Jesus is all right. I mean, you know, he's all right. He does well by me. We all respond to Jesus based on what we think he's forgiven us of. And that's church. That's what's happening all the time. I, I, I hate to paint so bleak a picture, but every response, every conversation, every relationship, every moment, all of it, is us responding to others and to life based on what we think Jesus has forgiven us of. Let me try to illustrate this point. I have an aunt and uncle that I love very much, and I, I, I know they'll never see this or listen to it because, and I'm not going to talk about it, but I'm going to talk very well of them. Um, they'll never see this because they absolutely hate God and Jesus and the church. And when I say hate, trust me, I mean hate. And they have two sons. Their sons are older now. They're in their early, mid-20s. So I grew up around these kids. I grew up around my aunt and uncle. And those two young men are literally some of the finest young men you will ever meet. And they always have been. Respectful, kind, committed. They work hard. They're doing well. They went to good colleges. They graduated from good colleges. I think the younger one might be finishing now, but they're great kids. They're great young men. They're upstanding young men. They're young men that you put your kids around to say, can you please teach my kid how to be a decent kid? And I'm not overblowing it for the sake of a sermon. Now, what appeal does the mainly moral Jesus have to them? Because they hate Jesus. My aunt has said out loud, we raised our kids to be great young men having nothing to do with God or the church, so what do I need them for? What does she think we're selling? This will make you a better person. She says, baloney, I don't need this to be a better person. My sons are great, so you can keep all that. This that leads to control and hatred and bigotry and all that, you know, sexism and all that. You can keep this garbage. I raised perfectly good sons without a single verse from this book. And she's right. So what appeal does this Jesus have to them? They've become virtuous with zero religious affiliation, with zero love for Jesus. They have become great and successful and virtuous and good and kind and moral. They were public schooled. They weren't even homeschooled. Now, why in the world did Jesus die if what he was dying for was completely attainable for any of us if you just tried hard enough? Why did he die? Why did he die if we don't need him to do anything, really? Maybe our problem isn't that we do wrong things. The opposite of sin isn't virtue. Christian parent, I want to ask you something. Is your goal for your kids any different than my aunt and uncle's for theirs? See, we don't believe we need a savior. We believe we need a life coach. And it kills worship. And it kills mission. And it's killing the church. Where is the reckless love for Jesus? We are a glorified country club sometimes when we should see ourselves as a group of people like this sinful woman just begging to get to the feet of Jesus. Where are our alabaster jars of perfume and our grateful weeping? 
our desperate faith, our reckless love. We keep trying new techniques and new books and new things to be a better church. Flush it all down the toilet where it belongs. We need Christ. Prostitutes. Vindicate the wisdom of God. If we didn't have younger kids in here today, I'd say that word a different way just to make sure we see it. Prostitutes vindicate the wisdom of God, not Pharisees, and we're all prostitutes. We've all sold ourselves to a thousand other things than Jesus. It's what we do. Remember, it's not that she had sinned a lot and he hadn't sinned very much. It's not what Jesus is saying. The issue was that she knew how sinful she was and this man had no idea. She knew she couldn't pay Jesus back. He thinks he doesn't owe that much. You see how it changes their response to Jesus? Don't think we're that far removed from this. What determines our response to Jesus is what we know about what he's released us of and forgiven us of and delivered us from. Some of us are just far too respectable in our Christianity to be in love. We look back over our lives and other than a few screw-ups here and there, which everybody has, we're way better off than filth like this woman. We were raised in church when church was actually something decided for us by our parents before we were ever born, and, which is fine, but we don't know why we're here other than that you're supposed to be, even as we get older. The problem with that is that there's no love in it. Affection doesn't bring us into this room. Duty brings us into this room. Affection doesn't take us to our neighbors' homes and into their lives and all these things. D- duty does. Fear does. Virtue does. So we've got all this service and no love. The problem isn't that we need new kinds of service to bring it out. We need affection for Jesus, and it will happen. In fact, we might be Christians because we really want to look like we have it all together. And that's what's motivating us in everything. And so a good religious life is functional to achieve that goal. We might be so clean we could never risk dirtying ourselves by being on the dirt by Jesus' feet. Now, granted... If you've been forgiven of some real sins, that posture makes sense, doesn't it? But if you're basically virtuous, if there are, if if you can measure yourself against everyone in your life and everyone in our town and everyone on the news and all those crazy people that do these wicked things, as long as I can look there and say, I'm not that bad the cross just gets further back in the periphery. Have you ever really faced the reality of who you are? Have we ever really faced the reality of who we are? We're not only going to have to reckon with our sin, beloved, we are going to have to reckon with how unimpressed God is with our goodness for the cross to start to hit home. So repent of your sin and your effort to be good and just believe that Jesus saves those who believe. You want to get close to who God is? You want to get close to Jesus? Be like this woman. It won't be through morality and virtue and righteousness that you get close to God. If that was the case, the Pharisees would have been closer than anybody. And Jesus called them a brood of snakes who were ripe for the fire of hell. Virtue won't bring you closer to God. But our ever-increasing recognition through the gospel, through the word, our ever-increasing recognition of the distance 
between who God is and who I am and what God has done by grace to close it, to close that distance, is what will change us into people that walk by faith and not by sight and rulers and measuring rods and things. This woman had been forgiven of far too much not to recklessly express her love. Have we? Have you been forgiven of much? If you have, much love is the fruit. We're so passionate about so much as Christians except for truly getting close to Jesus. And I fear, I fear there are some of us in this room right now that if we were to find another thing to follow that actually helped us achieve our goals quicker than Jesus is, we'd be out the door in a second. Draw near to Jesus this morning. He's reclining at table this morning, beloved. And the worse you are, the closer you can get. Don't let this pulpit and this nice button up fool you. I am a wretch. This isn't going to destroy your self-esteem to get low. Dear God, stop it. That's the problem. We could use a little getting low, beloved. It's not going to destroy us. Whatever gets you low enough and me low enough to finally need to look up to see Jesus, we should do that. We should feel that. We should believe that by faith, not by works, just by believing that he has forgiven you. Notice, that's all she did. She just expressed her love. Love him so much that it destroys your sense of self-preservation. You won't do that by being more involved. I, I, I think sometimes we have made church literally just about getting other Christians to volunteer for things that we think are important. We must know the depths of our own sinfulness. The answers that we are looking for are all faith-based. They all have to do with faith in Christ or the lack of it. Drawing nearer to Jesus from the youngest believer in this room to the most seasoned would be the best thing that could happen to our little church. Every command for my life and yours in the New Testament is grounded in what Jesus has done for me first. Therefore, only faith enables me to obey them and faith is a gift of grace. Do we want to stand out in a sea of people trying to look good and put together? So much of the Imperial Valley is that. So much of Brawley is that. You just need to look good, look as clean and as responsible and as great and as put together as you can and all the Christians can just sing each other's praises for how great they are. You want to stand out though? You really want to be unique and have the sinners that know they're sinners, whether they're clean or dirty, feel like they can run to you and be safe like she did with Jesus? Then we should embrace our brokenness, which as this story shows, makes Jesus look really valuable. Reckless love honors Jesus. Reckless love honors Jesus. Are we low enough to love him with reckless abandon? Beloved, as we close, the band's going to come and play quietly while we have the Lord's Supper, then we'll close together with a song when we're done. But as we close here, the Lord's Supper's over and the ushers come and take the offering. And as we think about God's word and who Jesus is and what he's saying, just there's no takeaway here this morning of things that you need to do other than to just believe that you've been forgiven if you know him of so much. All that you've done wrong and all that you think you've done right and all that you have no clue which it is, Jesus 
has thrown it all in the sea of forgetfulness and put up the sign that says no fishing. I don't know who said that, but it wasn't me. <laughs> Focus on who Jesus is this morning and what he's done for you. Let, let, let's start on our knees at his feet and he'll take us from there. Jesus is our life. He's our life. We'll come to this table in a moment to remember his death, his broken body, his blood for us. That's what we do when we take the Lord's Supper. If you know him, if you're following him, whether or not you're a member here, the table is open for you. If you came into this room this morning not knowing this Jesus, he is yours this morning to have. He still reclines at the table of this world. Come in. Come in. Repent of your sins. Repent of your rebellion and embrace him. And he will never, ever let you go. Let's pray. When we're done, you can form a line in the back. There's a table there. There's a table here. Again, if you know the Lord Jesus, we invite you to take the bread and the cup with us. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you so much for your mercy. We thank you so much for little moments like this to increase our picture of who you are, to widen it, to detail it a little bit more. We thank you so much. Lord, bring life into this room this morning. Jesus, the bread of life, may he fill us up. We ask this in his name. Amen. Thanks again for joining us. And if you have any questions about today's recording, Gateway Church, or what it means to follow Jesus Christ, you can reach us through the contact section of our website, gwbrawley.org.